Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. WTF is The Last Federation. It's by a company called Arkham Games. They've made quite a few titles for PC, but none of them smash hits. And they're all really interesting in their own way, with the weird exception of titles, which doesn't really fit into the whole modus operandi of the company, although it was a nice puzzle game nonetheless. They made a game called AI War. I've harped on about AI War for a long time because I think it's great. It's this really interesting mix of 4X with tower defense, focused on co-op against an AI that plays very asymmetrically to the way that the players do. It was really interesting. The way that you had to approach it was fundamentally different to other strategy games because the AI actually acted like a maniacal computer and had the superiority. Yeah? It's almost like that game was based around not poking the bear too hard because if the bear woke up, then you were dead. You had to tread lightly. Other games they made, they made something called Skyward Collapse, which was an interesting game that was a bit obtuse. It had a really cool concept. The idea is you were a god playing both sides, which I thought was really cool. And it was a turn-based game, so you were trying to make sure the balance of power didn't shift completely to one side or the other, or you would actually lose, which was really awesome. There's a game called Shattered Haven they did as well. They recently released a roguelike by the name of Bionic Dews, which is a more traditional roguelike, as in the turn-based style of you move, they move. And the concept behind that was in X number of days, you're going to be attacked by a huge force. You have to impede that as much as you can and build up your power before that final attack. And the thing that ties most of their games together, even including A Valley Without Wind, which was not particularly well received, is this high concept and a very specific goal. I, almost all of their games are very specifically goal-driven. They don't really just let you go at it. They give you a particular objective and say, okay, you must achieve this in some way, but this is what you've got to do. And the last federation is exactly the same in the sense that the aim of this game is to reform the federation. And how you do that? Well, you can do that in a number of different ways. And how you get there? Well, that's the interesting thing. It's it's the journey, not the destination, I suppose, with a game like this. Okay, so let's have a look at the options menu before we go in. I've actually beaten this game. As you probably noticed down here, I've run four campaigns with it. I spent quite a lot of time with it and I've beaten it once. Although, I definitely beat it in a rather interesting way, and I'd like to tell you about it, because it's one of those war stories that I think actually accentuates quite nicely why a game like this is interesting. So, if we have a look at the game options, you've got a number of useful options that I think you need in any kind of turn-based strategy game, which this game kind of is turn-based? A bit? Sort of? It's, it's, more, it's more what I call pause-based, in the sense that time runs in this game but it will only run when you tell it to. So you will see just how true that is in a minute. So you've got a number of different options here. The graphics options are fairly limited, I've got to say. This is nice though. It's very rare that you get this, the ability to change your save game directory. I know it's a little bit of a minor piece of convenience, but it's pretty cool to have it. And you can turn some of this stuff off. You'd think you wouldn't need to, but the game can actually get pretty intense later on. That might actually be a coding issue. Optimization-wise, if you have a huge amount of fleets and ships being simulated, the game can chug a little bit, even on my system, which is, of course, a hex core. So it can be a bit of a problem. You can mess around with this. All the sliders are available here, and you also have this stuff. There you go. So for the most part, it seems to have everything that I personally would want. Although what I would like are a couple of options which would allow you to display specific pieces of information on the screen without having to go into a separate menu to get there. Those options are missing, and it's certainly something that I hope they add in in future. One thing I will say about Arkham games is they definitely patch their games a lot, and they add fan requested features in so perhaps they will be able to make the ui in places just a little bit less obtuse so what's the point of this well it's to reform the federation let's show you just how we do that we're gonna go with an advanced start we're actually gonna start a new game here and i'm gonna show you the sort of starting stages of building your federation up and where you're supposed to go you can even increase the amount of years you start in which is going to of course, change the technology around just a little bit. Who do you want to crash land with? Well, each of these races you can crash land with, which will actually automatically make them your enemy, and it will affect what kind of flagship you get. 
You are the last of a murdered race by the name of the Hydrans. You are a giant Hydra in space. And you crash land, you take over a prototype starship of the first spacefaring race that you can find. Which, I gotta say, doesn't make a huge degree of sense in terms of the story, because apparently these guys wiped you out. How they did that without being spacefaring, well, that remains to be seen. I don't really get that part of the story. Maybe I just missed something, but each one of these really varies your starting ship up a little bit. So depending on what you want, well, that varies up quite significantly. Okay. Hmm. Let's start with the Thraxians, why not? Pissing off one of the most dangerous races in the game. That sounds like a good idea. Let's go with that. You can even go on observer mode here, which allows you to just watch the way that the game plays out. And each time it does play out differently, which is pretty neat. The universe kind of goes on without you. And you're going to see just how important that is in a minute. Okay, in we go. So that's you. You're a Hydra. Or Hydral, as they're called, not Hydran. Hydrans were actually a Star Trek race, if I recall correctly, so I messed that up. They were apparently the dictators of the solar system. They were all wiped out. Although, again, how that happened, I really don't know. <laughs> it's a little bit weird. So you hijack this starship, and then off you go. So that's it. This is your starship. And... This is a great chance to demonstrate the combat system. It's a little bit weird. The best way I can describe this is a turn-based shoot-em-up. Let me show you what I mean. So, every time I move, it's going to do this. It's going to move me for a fraction of seconds in the actual game time itself. And then it's going to fire. And then it's going to pause again. And then it's going to fire and pause and fire. And you, you keep doing this. And all of these projectiles can actually be dodged in the same way that you dodge in a shoot 'em up. Now, you have three different weapon mounts, and you can swap them out between fights if you so desire. And you also have a bunch of special abilities. So I have something right here called the Geiger Cannon. I can fire that, and that's going to do 60,000 damage. Every time I use a special ability, it also does this pulse, which destroys incoming shots. Again, very much like a shoot 'em up. So you can actually maneuver around away from shots. So these these are chasing me. So if I actually move out of the way, those shots are going to miss me because they're continuing in that particular direction. Now, on the harder difficulty, difficulty levels, this becomes far more pertinent because the shots will do a lot of damage. It can also be important later on when the races that you're fighting actually have better technology than you do because they're going to be hitting you like a truck. So you do have to watch out for that. Now, I was talking about switching weapons. I can do that. So that's a spread shot. Very shmup-like. Then you got an energy blaster and a gravity lance. The energy blaster, really good for taking out shields. You can also mess around with your power levels here. So if I want to increase my weapon range and effectiveness, I can pump all my power into that. I'm not taking too much damage, so I can do that. Although that does slow me down and affect my maneuverability. I've broken his shields now. So if I keep up with him and then switch over to the gravity lance, I'm going to pop him very easily. There we go. Gravity lance is very good against the hull. Different kinds of ships have different kinds of vulnerabilities and so on and so forth. I can launch a wave of fighters if I so desire. There we go. And they're pretty good for running into shots for you as well as just doing the things that interceptors generally do. Fly around and be rather irritating. We'll fire the Geiger cannon again, which passes through targets, which is really quite cool. Their shields are down, so I think we can actually open up with the gravity lance here. And you'll be in a lot of trouble. Now, by default, the ships are set to auto-fire. You don't have to. You actually don't have to do auto-fire at all. You can target specific vessels on the screen if you so desire. All right, well, I won that fight quite easily, so we're going to get out of that. And now the Thraxians don't really like us too much because we stole their prototype starship and we blew up basically the rest of their ships, which is not so pleasant. It is actually possible for you to be diplomatic in that fight. If you docked with the survey platform, you can give them a bunch of technology to try and appease them. So you don't necessarily have to piss them off. Now, once you've gone through the initial fight, you go to this screen. This is the solar system, and each planet has a different race on it. None of these races, with the exception of your starting race, actually has the ability to travel the stars, which again makes the story nonsensical because some of these guys were apparently the folks that wiped you out in the first place. That's your destroyer's, destroyed homeworld. How they wiped you out, 
I have no idea. <laughs> the Acutians supposedly launched a planet cracker at you, which is what destroyed your homeworld. How they did that without actually having space technology remains to be seen. So, I, I don't really know what's up with that. Whatever the case, it is up to you. Since you're basic, I wouldn't call you an omnipotent being, but you're more advanced than everyone else here. So it's up to you to decide which of these races that you elevate to spacefaring status. And whenever you do that, it pisses off the other races. However, you can be secret about it. For instance, the Burlesque military has a secret p proposal which will involve you smuggling in spacefaring technology under the guise of something else. Which means that you will not piss off everybody else, so that's pretty good. Alternatively, I could just go and help this race right here. So what's the point of the game? It's to form the Federation. How do you form the Federation? Well, through a variety of different actions. So let's go and elevate the Burlesque first. Let, let's get them up and let's start working on the diplomacy. So we will be able to work on them. They're, they don't like us too much, but they will when we take out the flagships here and we actually deliver the technology to them. So here we go. All right. I even have an emergency response hangar to back me up. Cool. All right, so we're going to go and destroy the enemies here. Because apparent... Oh, that apparently... I suppose that was supposed to belong to me. It doesn't seem to, which is a little weird. It says it belonged to me. Apparently, that's not true. All right, never mind then. We want to destroy as many of these ships as possible, because if we blow them all up, then we actually end up getting some hydral technology, which I could do with. And that gives you ship customization options, different special abilities, and different weapon sets that you can actually use on your ship. Now, when I give these guys spacefaring technology, they're, of course, going to start traveling the stars. But the most important thing about it is that it unlocks all of the diplomacy options and you could start influencing the race and telling them what to do because they're grateful to you for giving them spacefaring technology so they're going to take your advice because they know you're more advanced than they are so they'll do all manner of different things and that's kind of up to you do you want them to focus on their economy do you want to research technology with them do you want to help them out with their infrastructure do you want want to help them to build ships do you want to influence them to attack other races you can do all of that and more besides and the point is it's almost like you're playing a 4X kind of empire building game, but you don't have the ability to build an empire. You're messing with everybody else's empires. Now, this is fairly typical of the really interesting high concept stuff that Arkham Games actually does. And I think that's their real strength. And honestly, with Last Federation, I think they've nailed it better than any other game with the exception of AI War. This is easily their most accessible high concept game. You know, I wouldn't say it's the most accessible game because Titleist exists, but it is a very, very accessible and easy to play game once you've got through about an hour of words that the game throws at you. The credit that I would give them is that they did a good job of introducing you to concepts gradually. Stuff like your special abilities, if you play the game the first time with tutorials on, you don't get any of this stuff until later on. It explains it later. The power bars, you don't get any of that either. So the combat is very simple initially, then it introduces you to all sorts of different concepts later, which makes it a lot easier, as well as unlocking diplomacy screens and all the, the kind of... What's the best way to describe it? All of the information screens that are available here, like all of this stuff, that's a lot of info. Or all of these graphs, for instance, all of this stuff. You don't get this at the start. So they do a good job of explaining from the very start how things work and making sure that you get introduced to things at a fairly gradual pace. Okay, so we've given a race spacefaring technology, and we've done it in secret, which is even better. That means we didn't piss off anyone else, which is nice. So what can I do with these guys? Well, I can talk to them. Each of the different races has a different way of communicating with you. You can do friendly and hostile acts on pretty much everything in the game, but there's this fourth option here, which is going to be something different. So... If I go here, I speak to the CEOs of the Acutians. These are capitalist robots. And you can get a lot of things done here, but if you speak to the CEOs, then depending on which industries are most successful right now depends on what options you have available to you, and this changes around. You can mess with them and you can influence them in a particular way, but right now the most popular industries are wholesale trade, transportation, and entertainment, and they all have separate, separate options, and some of these are cheaper than others. 
In certain respects, you can actually only gain access to things, to very special abilities by talking to one specific CEO. If I go back to the Burlust, then that's, they're ro ruled by warlords. And in order to actually get anything going here, I have to build respect and gain leverage with the warlords. More often than not, that actually involves challenging them to a duel and killing them in combat in order to have them replaced by somebody else, which allows you to gain leverage. You can also bribe them and do all sorts of things like that. Now, this is very important because you need to gain control over these kind of galactic senates in order to get them to join your federation. So if I want to create a federation, I have two options here. Pressure to join the federation here or create a strong federation, which is going to require me to become friendly with the Acutians and the Thoraxians, who are particularly violent races. So that can be a little bit difficult. And that's actually a different objective to creating a regular federation. And there's achievements and things associated with that. Alternatively, I could pressure them into joining them, which would require a significant army as well as a decent amount of influence. So they're unique in that respect that I can pressure them in a particular way. Each of these races joins you in a different way, which is kind of cool. Now, if we want to talk about friendly acts, well, these guys are kind of friendly with me right now. So I could take on a joint mission with them. I could raid a pirate convoy for loot, for instance. Let's go do that. So this is a good way to get bribery items that you can then use to influence these kind of galactic senates and such a little bit later on. Uh, launch some ships. There we go. And then we'll head in that general direction. Put our spread shot on them. We're going to go and board these freighters in order to steal a bunch of stuff. And it's going to be awesome. There we go. Wood Valley Venison Steak and an Unscannable Hand Phaser. Each of these items, by the way, is more affected with certain races than it is with others, as you might imagine. So now we just blow up the pirates and that's that. You might notice the combat is rather colorful. There's a lot going on. I mean, the combat is actually a hell of a lot of fun to do. I, uh, initially, you can kind of do it on autopilot because the ships are not really that strong. But later on, once races start to develop technology, particularly if they get ahead of you, because technology is something that you can only really acquire through stealing or through actually helping another race research it. You can't research it on your own. You can end up in a position where your ship is no longer the dominant force in the universe, which is kind of great. So there is a lot you can do in this game, but what it ultimately comes down to is tweaking numbers. And this game is just laden with stats and numbers. Every planet has different ratings in terms of its economy, medical capabilities, environmental capabilities, public order, and there's events that go on. Right now, a biological weapon test went wrong and just murdered a bunch of people on planet Skold, which is not too great. You also, of course, have different influences and things like that with every single race. So you're more often than not playing with numbers, and you're trying to balance everything. And if you try to build the Federation, you are going to run into problems, because anti-Federation organizations will form, and you will be dealing with anti-Federation insurgents and protesters, which can often build up sizable armadas and fleets, especially if you end up ganging up on one of the planets, because that will generate a lot of anti-Federation sentiment. So you've got to balance that out, and you've got to kind of resolve conflicts between races because the whole point is to unite the solar system. How you do that is kind of interesting and it can go in a variety of different ways. Alright. It looks like they're having some real problems in terms of public order. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to see if there's anything I can do with that. Property development, will that help? Mm, not by the looks of it. I could offer medical assistance, though. They're certainly having some medical problems, so I could do 12 months of that. This is a dispatch mission, meaning that I can actually accelerate the game simulation quite significantly, and you'll see, there we go, I gained some influence with them, and I was able to increase their medical capabilities here as well, which is pretty good. Stuff happened in the background, though. The Skylaxians researched Vibroblades. And uh, the Acutians actually managed to get into space without my aid. So they probably don't like me all that much at this point. Because I didn't really help them out. Indeed, they are not too keen on me. Nothing that can't be fixed, but you see what I mean. Alternatively, I could just go and attack them if I wanted. I can go into a hostile act. I can sabotage them, hire informants in order to do all manner of different things. Do sneakier stuff behind the scenes. This game is about influencing the different races. You can get involved in direct conflict, and it will help in certain scenarios. Like, you can fight off a pirate armada, for instance. 
In fact, I can go and do that right now. Let's click to attack, launch a surprise attack on the pirate armada, and we'll, we'll, we'll go and fight them. And the Burlusts are allied with us in this fight, so we should have very little problem taking out the pirates here. But your direct influence is perhaps less important than your ability to mess with people. And you are trying to manipulate the racers to do what you want. Sometimes that won't happen. Sometimes you'll get into a position where you piss them off too much. And that can be a real problem because they can be become hugely resistant to you. The first game that I played, I decided I'm just going to dick on this one race. I'm going to steal a technology. I'm going to do what I can there. But here's the thing. They actually gained a lot of power. And by the time I realized it, they became a dominant force in the universe, started wiping out my allies, and I couldn't fight them anymore. So I messed with them too much to the point where I pissed them off, and they deliberately did stuff that was counter to what I was doing. Yeah, It's kind of enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of stuff. They allied with other races to try and take me down. It was pretty ugly. Let's get emergency shield power back online, because we just took a huge amount of hits there. Don't want that. The game that I won, well, that went in a very interesting fashion. I got pretty lucky early on. There was an intergalactic war that actually wiped out the race that I had initially pissed off. I stole a bunch of technology for them, from them, and then they annoyed one of the stronger races and got wiped out, which was great because that's one major thorn in my side gone. I was then able to form a two-race federation between the two robotic races, who I kind of... It, it was kind of cool because what I did was there was this race of robots where they had a kind of parliament and depending on which of the parties is in power depends on what kind of agenda I can follow. What I was able to do was to keep the roboticists in power by manipulating their political system, which allowed me to do a whole bunch of stuff which benefited the other robot race in the game, which allowed me to develop them into an economic powerhouse and also ally with them to create the federation. And eventually, it came down to the fact that there was only one planet in the game, and I'm going to actually die here if I keep taking hits like this. Good lord. This is ugly. Let's put more power into shields and maneuver around. I can't catch him. The these guys are really annoying initially. Really hard to deal with. Just want to try and get into range. I can't hit him with the Giga Cannon from this range, which is a little annoying. I want to track targets. Eh. We can probably just come in on them there and just, just make sure we're not behind him. And we should be fine. Uh, set up the energy blaster there too. So yeah, there was this last planet and it was so resistant. Like, it was a warrior race. Pretty much everyone on their planet was a warrior. They had good warrior technology. They had bomb shelters and planetary ion cannons set up to deflect what I was doing. And even with the combined armada of the entire Federation at that point, I still couldn't break them. I was like, what can I do here? So I decided, you know what? These guys are a thorn in my side, time to wipe them out. I paid the, the CEOs of the Acutians to repeatedly dump toxic waste on their planet to poison their atmosphere and their people. I sabotaged their economy to the point where they were no longer able to rebuild the planetary defenses that I destroyed through espionage, and I eventually poisoned their entire world, and everybody died, and I won the game. Strangely enough, that didn't piss off too many people because these guys had been so belligerent that even apparently global bioterrorism was completely fine with the rest of the galaxy at that point. It, I gotta say, I had a bit of a power trip on it and outside of this combat, which is still pretty fun by the way, this game really is about power tripping and it does things fairly well. I would say there's definitely a couple of problems with it. One of them being the inconsistency in which the game treats certain actions. Like, for instance, paying the Acutians to dump toxic waste on a planet. That seems like a really bad thing, and yet, in fact, none of the races were bothered by it, except for the guys who I was dumping toxic waste on. And yet, if you take a pilot that you've captured in combat to sell at the black market, everyone hates you! Like, look at it! Look at it! <laughs> it's ridiculous. You, you actually lose influence with almost everybody. How do they even know this happened? Like, most of these guys aren't even spacefaring, so I, I don't really know why that is. There's some weird inconsistency between which actions the game considers evil and which it considers good. Even when you do something horrible to an enemy race, as long as the other guys are at war with them, they're like, cool, keep at it. 
which seems a little bit odd. You'd think that those guys would get a bit worried at that point. So brutality, more often than not, seems to be the way to go, even though manipulation behind the scenes is the way to get the best result. This game certainly bears multiple playthroughs, because every time that you start, things are going to be completely different. The balance of power shifts, technology ends up trading into different hands, and it bears a lot of replayability. And that's the only way you're going to get all the endings as well. The ending that I got, well, I went to the achievement screen and noticed there was a bunch of stuff that I missed out. Like, you can win without ever having a planet change hands, for instance. Whereas in mine, there were planets being conquered, so that didn't happen. You can win with all the races still alive, you know. And th those are kind of the really good endings. Other problems I've got are the idea of keeping certain fairly important information on a different screen kind of out of the way. So what you would think would be useful is to know how many anti-federation protesters and insurgents are available. You can find that out, but only if you right click and go to this area right here. It's a pretty important number and it would be actually quite nice to see in this little section here. I think you could very easily add that. There's also some really weird kind of situations where you can't figure out exactly why a planet isn't keeling over and dying. That was what really got me. In, in the last game that I eventually won, I'm like, why can't I break these guys? We have a combined armada power of over 2 million or whatever. The game had so many armadas circling. It was, in fact, the, the, the Burlist had so many armadas circling it that it slowed the simulation speed down to a crawl and actually caused frame rate drop, and yet we still couldn't break this one sodding planet. It was ridiculous. They didn't have any ships, and we still couldn't kill them. And the game, I think, does a fairly poor job of giving you good feedback as to why you can't deal with them. Like, they, they tell you what the ground troop power is here, like 3.3 billion, 3.3 billion what? What does that mean? And more to the point, what's the ground troop power of everything that's attacking? It doesn't tell you, it only tells you the spacefaring power and armada. So you really have absolutely no idea why something's not going the way that it is. And in a game about tweaking numbers, that level of unknown can be a fairly severe problem. I may have just somehow missed out and not really manage to figure out exactly what was going on there. That is entirely possible. Yeah. But it's a bit weird to not be given that information. I do think a lot of this game is about discovery, though. For instance, I didn't know that one of the weak races that go by the name of the... Per something? The Peltians. Yes, the Peltians. They're kind of weak in combat, but what they are very good at is suicide bombing. So if you want a planet bombed... You piss off the Peltians to the point where they will go and suicide bomb an enemy planet. So you want to see Discord and you want to ruin the relationship between that and the target. Of course, these are the kind of things that you can discover through exploration. And I actually like that a lot. And I think that's actually a strength of the game as opposed to a weakness that you're not told that. So I think there's a balance to be struck between transparency and giving you the information you need and also allowing you to discover the different mannerisms and eccentricities of the races themselves. Speaking of that, I absolutely love the fact that each of these races has a completely different way of dealing with it. I want to give these guys spacefaring tech. Each of these missions for spacefaring tech involves actually dropping technology in this zone while a bunch of other kind of pirates and racers try and stop you from getting there. Which is, is a kind of neat way of doing things, honestly. It's the idea of smuggling technology in through a blockade. You have to avoid these spy drones and all that sort of thing. It... It really fit, it does fit in with Arkham Games' design philosophy of we are trying to achieve a concept and we're going to do it through any means necessary up to and including some significantly weird stuff that barely makes any sense at all but is just kind of cool anyway and just the ends justify the means in terms of their game mechanics. Ah, and I almost died. Wow, okay. But I got through. There we go. That seems like the best way to describe it, really. The kind of ends justify the means sort of situation. And I can kind of respect that, honestly. I like the idea of having a game with a high concept and the mechanics are just kind of built around the idea of getting there somehow. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I do like companies that actually try and do that. In the case of these guys, who are actually space pigs, as you can see here, we speak to the regents. And we can actually bribe the regents and do all sorts of things like that. And the regent has a different priority. The 
the really cool thing is, I think it's the Thraxians. If you speak to the Thraxian queen, she has mood swings. And her mood swings indicate what you can do and what you can't do and what kind of things you can talk to her about. And if you bribe her with the right kind of stuff, she's more likely to change her mood and all that kind of thing. It's really kind of neat. And they, they did a great job of giving each race a very specific personality that you have to deal with. And the conflicts between the different races are very interesting. It's a very unique game, and it's definitely the most accessible game that Arkin has made so far. I think they've done a pretty good job with it, honestly. A couple of criticisms I would have of it... I think probably the... Just the level of exploitation that you can throw at, at certain elements of the combat. Particularly, there's uh, every now and again, you're able to go into an asteroid belt or an ice belt to find a new piece of hydron technology. Every time you do that, you go up against these ancient hydron weapon systems, which sounds very dangerous in theory, until you realize that you can very easily cloak all the way past them, get to the area in question, then spam an ability every turn in order to shoot down all of the bullets coming your way and instantly win every time. Uh, there's no challenge to that whatsoever. And there's certain other missions that can be very easily exploited like that. If you're going to steal technology, unless they have a lot of armadas in orbit, you can just go there and just sit there, take the technology from the station, and that's it. And do it over and over and over again. And it's just absurdly easy, which I, I don't really know what's going on with that. Maybe it's just the fact that I happen to be playing on normal mode, maybe on a hard mode. That would be a different factor. I think... Once you've maybe done your first playthrough, maybe crank up the combat difficulty because I think you'll enjoy it a lot more. You're able to really consider your moves very carefully to avoid as many bullets as possible, use your abilities at the right times, and all sorts of things like that. This is the flagship customization, by the way. These are the weapons I've currently got available. I can find more unlocks as I go through, and I can put all sorts of things in here, like different kinds of fighters. I can change over to cloaking field there. I can change my offensive ability. There's even some really cool stuff like nuclear missiles, which actually do environmental damage to the planets here above, which is just a nice little effect. And overall, there are just so many different options available. I mean, there's all of these, and then there's everything you can do with the Regent there, including local deals, interplanetary relations. You can you can use these guys to mess around with different races. Each of the races is kind of more or less diplomatic. Some of them are very good at convincing other races. Some of them are very good at intimidating other races. Some of them just don't care about that kind of thing at all. And there's a lot of diversity there. And each game will play out difficult differently as a direct result of which races you get on your side, which races become enemies, and all that kind of thing. So, overall, Last Federation is a really intriguing game. I have sunk a fairly large amount of time into it. I mean, I spent pretty much all day playing this, and most of the day before as well. And I eventually got that win out of it. I feel like I want to play it a little bit more. I want to see how the next game plays out. And I think it's one of those games where you can get real war stories out of it. Because there are so many different things you can do. It is a very odd game in the sense that the lack of control that you have and the fact that you're really just kind of influencing behind the scenes might bother a lot of people that are into being able to micromanage each aspect of your empire. You can only really suggest to the existing empires. You're not a planetary power anymore. You're just one big snake in a powerful ship that's trying to mess with everybody else to try and get them to work together as a federation, either through coercion, subversion, or indeed just plain old diplomacy. And that's a really interesting concept for a game like this that generally doesn't happen all that often. And that, to me, as far as I'm concerned, makes the game worth your time. Current price for this is $20. It's currently $15, though, on the 25% off launch sale. I think this is, outside of AI War anyway, the best game that Arkan has made up to this point. And I think that it is really intriguing and very much worthy of your time. Worth a shot, definitely. Takes about an hour to really get into it once you get past the tutorial messages and things like that. Some people may be bothered by the fact that if you boil it down to its core, it really is just about tweaking numbers and messing around with graphs and things like that. And you're right, it is, to some degree. But it's done it in a very stylish way. It's made it very intriguing. I mean, it's a game about intrigue, for God's sake. Of course, it's intriguing. And that turn-based combat system it's got actually works shockingly well. Yeah? It's actually a lot of fun when you're weaving in and out of the just 
bolts of energy everywhere, the really colorful battlefields that just remind you of old school shoot 'em ups there's fighters everywhere, you're launching 60 fighters at a time from your ship, you're using computer viruses to hijack other vessels and all sorts of things like that. That's pretty awesome. It's very creative, a really interesting way of doing things, as far as I'm concerned. The Last Federation, ladies and gentlemen, currently available on Steam for $20 or your regional equivalent. Not the kind of game that you would find anywhere else or indeed from any other company. And I suppose we can thank Arkin for having the big ideas and every now and again, even though they're a little bit hit or miss, actually managing to nail it which is exactly how I described The Last Federation. They really did nail the concept very well indeed. My name has been Total Biscuit, taking a look at The Last Federation. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.